Well, once again, welcome. So glad you're here today. We start a new series called Won't You Be My Neighbor? I don't know. Anybody else familiar with that phrase? I don't know. Maybe some of you watching at home, watching on Facebook. Hey, we appreciate you watching. Uh, and if you want the 3D experience, you get in your car and you come down here. That's the way that works. And we'd love for you to be here. All right. But some of you recognize that song or that, that phrase, won't you be my neighbor? Many of you know this song. Many of you heard it growing up. The famous Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. In fact, sing, sing. Here it is. Let's go. Let's go. of this beautiful day since we're together we might as well say would you be mine would you be mine won't you be my neighbor won't you please won't you please please won't you be my neighbor You know, I thought about, you know, putting on a sweater, okay? uh, but there's, there's two things. Uh, one, our thrift store didn't have one, and this is Florida, and I don't need a sweater. So, But for 33 years, this is how Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, began his children's show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And Mr. Rogers was a, affectionately known and, and, and wanted everyone, especially children to know that they were worthy of love and that everyone is, has the capacity to love. And though it's really was well, simple, love yourself and love, your, love others. And for more than three decades, this follower of Jesus invited the most vulnerable among us to make believe that we were in this neighborhood. And there we could discover the power of love. And ironically, Mr. Rogers, who was also Reverend Rogers, I mean, he never served a local church, but the Presbyterian Church asked Fred Rogers to serve as a minister to children through television and media. And they were his flock, and he was their pastor. And I'm real sure that you would agree with me that a I mean, a quick read through the newspapers or listening to the news shouts that our world is desperate and desperate need for this simple yet, yet profound message. Followers of Jesus have been given the assignment to first love God and to second, we love ourselves as we love our neighbors. And so what if by loving our neighbor, Jesus literally means the precious people who live in our neighborhood? What if by loving our neighbors, Jesus meant that regardless of their age, their, whether they're rich or poor, or their education, and here Mr. Rogers can help us again, because I'm convinced that the cry of our neighbors who do not yet love or know God in Christ is, is the gift of Christian community. The last line in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood theme song here, our, our lost and hurting and broken neighbors are desperately crying out, please, won't you be my neighbor? And often this cry is 
disguised as addiction or greed. Sometimes it's masqueraded as violence or hatred. But the deepest part of their soul is a cry for our neighbors to simply be loved. And followers of Jesus are invited to hear their cry and to be their neighbors. So for the next four weeks, we're going to learn together about loving our neighbors. And both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible are in alignment about this charge. Jesus, the God-man, the God, God in flesh, affirmed this command in Matthew 22, 34 through 40, and that says it best. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they, they met together to question him again. And one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with a question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. And the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So by this time in, in Matthew's retelling of the life of Jesus, he's, he's really angered uh, two groups of religious leaders in Israel the Pharisees, who were the ultra-conservative, and the Sadducees, who would be considered the ultra-liberal. I guess not much has changed in 2,000 years in religion or politics. The Pharisees, who believed in the meticulous keeping of the law of Moses and uh, established 613 strict rules that had to be followed, were now trying to back Jesus into a corner and they wanted to trick Jesus into saying something that was contrary to the law. And this was about both groups trying to discredit Jesus because of the, the crowds he was drawing and, and they were in fear of losing the tight control over the people that they had. Now every Jew knew the answer to this question because it was taught to them at a very young age. Which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Well, there was a prayer that they recited called the Shema, found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. This was a prayer that was recited twice a day, morning and evening, by every good Jew, and this prayer was so important, it was prayed corporately at the weekly Shabbat worship service. And it was a prayer that was uh, ended the holiest of seasons, Yom Kippur. And upon death, if you were a faithful Jew, you would speak these words as you died. So the bottom line here is Jesus got the answer right. He knew the right thing to say. But then Jesus as he had a habit of doing, he changed things up a little bit by adding a portion of Leviticus 19.18, which says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now think about it. The Pharisees, I mean, they knew this verse from Leviticus 19, and it's in the Law of Moses too. It's a it's kind of hard to disagree with Jesus here because they, they were cool with the part about loving God, but part two about loving your neighbor as yourself, well, that kind of left them scratching their heads a bit. And if we're honest, it leaves us scratching our heads sometimes too. And for those of us who follow Jesus, if we've been wrecked by that reckless love of God, loving God seems an appropriate response. We can get that. We can praise, we can worship, the adoration, the thanksgiving, that should flow from those of us who have experienced the grace and mercy of Jesus. But that's, I think we can probably agree that loving our perfect God can seem a lot easier if, than loving our imperfect neighbor who we can see. Yet Jesus 
says that if we boil it all down to the essential nature of what it means to follow God, loving our neighbors has to be included. So our teaching team uh, wrestled hard with this message as we landed on this very practical question for us to consider today. How do I love my neighbor as I love myself? And as we wrestled with this question, the Holy Spirit pointed uh, us to Jesus' interaction with another Pharisee named Nicodemus. And somehow Jesus' ministry and especially the miracles stirred a, the highly religious, uh, we might call him overchurched man, to come to Jesus under the veil of night. So listen to how Jesus addresses this man's curiosity in John 3, 5 through 8. It says, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can re reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Now let's frame this all around what it means to love our neighbors. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is the one who births this spiritual life in people. And some of us know, uh, I, I mean, I grew up in this church. My grandparents were among the first members here back in 1922. And my mother made sure that I was here every Sunday. But when I was about 19, I moved to Fort Lauderdale for a job. And being a 19-year-old boy living in Fort Lauderdale with more money than I could spend. It was not a recipe for keeping someone walking closely with God. But the seeds that were planted in my childhood one day led me, led me back to church where God saved me in more ways than one. And I discovered the beauty and the joy of Christian community at this thing that we call church. And that, friends, is what I want to talk to about this morning. The, the God inside of me stirred and shouted, yes, this is true. And this is what Jesus here calls the wind of the Holy Spirit, blowing wherever and whatever direction it chooses. Think of it like maybe you're down at the beach. Maybe you're down Fort Myers Beach flying a kite. And one moment it's, it's, it's heading out over the Gulf of Mexico, but then the wind changes and all of a sudden it's heading over towards Sanibel. See, the Holy Spirit cannot be contained by our religious structures and categories. The Holy Spirit is running wild in the universe, and Jesus is looking for women and men who will catch that wind, catch that Spirit, whether it be in our schools or in a bar or in a coffee shop or a yoga class, ball fields, classrooms, bedrooms, boardrooms. Love their neighbors. And my favorite way of illustrating this is, is well, maybe it's like this. What way is the Spirit blowing? But let me break this down even more simply. How do I love my neighbors, I love myself. In keeping with Jesus teaching about the Holy Spirit, being like the wind, let me suggest three steps. First, ask. Second, listen. And third, obey. First, we ask the Holy Spirit. And I know it seems simple, but how often do we get ready for our day and not ask the Holy Spirit to lead us supernaturally and use us. I mean, Jesus told us in prayer that if we knock and keep on knocking, so how about that? When you open your eyes the first thing in the morning, do, you, do your eyes pop open and you pray something like, Holy Spirit, I'm here and I'm available. Help me to feel the direction of your Spirit is blowing. Then when the Holy Spirit speaks... We need to listen to those promptings. 
Think about how many times you have had this inner prompting in your, in, in your heart and you just passed it off as maybe I had a bad taco or that's just some crazy thought I'm having. The guy once asked his pastor, what, what does God's voice sound like? And the pastor was pretty wise, so he said, you know, it sounds like your voice. And I found this to be true. God seldom sounds like Morgan Freeman or James Earl Jones. Simba, remember who you are. Now, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Finally, when we have the guts to obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit leads us to start a conversation with our neighbor, we just open our mouths. It's that simple. Now, my friend, uh, uh, Pastor Patty Nomazi, um, up at our, our Sarasota campus, she's our pastor up there, she always prays for divine appointments. And sure, almost, sure enough, almost every time the wind and the Spirit blows and she engages in a meaningful kind of faith conversations with total strangers. And I mean, the strangers don't always fall to their, their knees and repent of their sins and say a sinner's prayer. But a seed for Jesus gets planted. The wind blows and Patty simply asks God to make her sensitive so that she listens to the voice of God. She looks for open doors. She never pries one open, but then Patty has the guts to walk through that door. And Patty doesn't live this way once a year when she's on a mission trip. She lives this way when she goes to CVS or to Publix or is sitting around in her, at her community pool or eating dinner at restaurants. It's everyday supernatural stuff. One way we live out the, our loving our neighbors as well is our church partnership with Franklin Park Elementary School. And today I've invited my friend Bill to come and, and share with us a little bit about some of the things that are, that are going on uh, at Franklin Park and have gone on. Bill is our, the director of our SIN Ministries, so please welcome Bill up here. Good morning, church family. Good morning, Pastor Ed. Good morning. Bill, when, did, when and how did our partnership and our relationship begin with Franklin Park Elementary School? Well, believe it or not, it's been almost 14 years ago. We uh, were looking for a sort of a concrete way that we could reach out and do something that would be meaningful. And it was about that time that we were really beginning to notice the need of children going back to school. And so we started out very, um, very insignificantly doing an in-gathering of school supplies. And we took those to Franklin Park because A, they were close to us, and B, we knew that they were under-resourced and there was a need. Uh, over time, that has evolved. We uh, later on, through Pastor Arlene Jackson's leadership, took a program in during Christmas where partnering with the school, they would identify families who were most needful. And so we would then do our in-gathering of resources with the buckets that were being passed, and we would use those collections to go out and buy toys for those kids. And we would take them into the school, set up shop, and the parents would be given appointment times to come in and identify those things that they thought were most appropriate for their kids to take home for Christmas. And just the other night, I just happened to catch out of the corner of my eye, there was a mother with her daughter, and they had caught my badge, 
with Grace Church on it, and the mother was whispering to the daughter, do you remember last Christmas, the toys that you got? It was they, they, who made that possible. And I don't say that to be bragging, because actually I would rather not be singled out that way. But the point is, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. And God knows. So he leaves it to us. All right. Well, how might we uh, specifically pray for the staff and students at Franklin Park Elementary? Well, number one, I think some of you probably remember that a couple of weeks ago we made a big announcement that Franklin Park is now a B school. Yes. And that may not sound too important, but it's very important for a number of reasons. And the thing that, that I really need to impress upon you is that when we first started partnering with Franklin Park, they were at the bottom of the heap. So this has been a long time coming, mm -hmm. from an F school to a B school. Yes. And so I want you to pray for that success to continue mm -hmm. because they've had several changes in leadership through the years that we've partnered with them. And right now, and I don't want to get myself in trouble, but I have to say it's a breath of fresh air and things seem to be going really well and the connections between staff and administration and school and families in the community seems to be improving. So we need to pray for that. We need to pray for safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the things that are happening in our world today, the mass shootings, the things that are happening that way, but not only that, we have so many people on the roadways today. We have so many students who are out at bus stops waiting for pickup and to be dropped off. And I'm, I'm really heartened by the efforts that I've seen in the community over the past year. But there's much more to be done. And we just need to pray for safety for all the students all the staff, because when they go back to school, it's not like back in, in the olden days when I was in school. We just went to school. We didn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And we just went back and had a good time. And now there's so much more on the plates and so many more things for families and students to be concerned about that we just need to pray for all of that. Yes. And if somebody's interested in getting involved, how can they do that? Well, you can talk to me. <laughs> uh, as Ed said, I'm, I'm the leader of the SIN team, which really isn't just about Franklin Park. Franklin Park just happens to be our closest community partner. And so you hear probably more about that. But it also has to do with other missions and other outreach. So if that's something you're interested in, feel free to see me or write it down on your Let's Connect slip and Rochelle will shoot an email to me so that I can get back to you. And I certainly appreciate your support and I look forward to the coming year and the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. And I want to take a, just a minute for us to pray. Let's pray for uh, not only Franklin Park, but all the schools going back. Father, we come before you as your, your neighborhood, your community of believers. 
And Lord, as uh, our neighbors, uh, kids go back to school, as our kids go back to school, as the teachers, the staff, the administration, Lord, we just ask that you would be with them all, keep them safe, keep them on track to what needs to happen, that the children learn, that they be safe. And Lord, most importantly, we pray that they will know you. Lord, thank you for our partnership that we have with Franklin Park Elementary. And Lord, we know it wasn't our reaching out or their reaching out to us, it was you. And Lord, we thank you that uh, you have made this our neighborhood, our neighborhood school that we can support and can be part of, and can be proud of when they achieve something like a B rating. Thank you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank Bill once again for coming up. Um, Back in 2017, I got the opportunity to do a TINDA, a conference that was called To Love Your Neighborhood. It was up in Philadelphia, and I, I liked it so much I went again last year. And author and pastor uh, Mandy Smith spoke, and uh, I liked her, uh, her talk so much I started following her blogs, and she recently posted something I thought was very good. She says, every church which welcomes and loves is doing something about violence. Who knows how many desperate people have chosen not to act on their despair because they've been welcomed into a community. Turns out the same welcoming work also is a way to do something about suicide, depression, and addiction, and et cetera, et cetera. Folks, we need to be the neighbors. The neighbors to all who come in. You know, Jamie and I, uh, we, we, we read devotions together as part of helping God keep us as a couple together. And recently we, we read a devotion by a Christian music artist, Tim Timmons, and it was called Starts With Me. And in that devotion he said, how many times have you prayed, God, use me, or here I am, send me, as Isaiah did. And these are wonderful prayers, but I think that we've prayed prematurely in, in my life. I seem to, to be great at doing things for God and asking Him to come alongside me in what I'm doing. And yet I've missed the point. I've jumped from the here I am part and skipped to, ahead to send me. What if on my own power I'm, not, I'm unable or I'm unusable? So think about your most recent conversation with Jesus. Or think about your most recent prayers. Are they more about inviting Jesus into what you're doing? Or are they asking him to see where he is moving? Where that wind of the Spirit is blowing and how we can join him in that? We've been given many strong commands by Jesus. The first and most important command, love God, and then love others. Or maybe it was the, Peter, do you love me? Then go feed my sheep. Or abide in me, Jesus the vine. And then I will bear much fruit out of you. In all these conversations that Jesus had, the point was to, for his people to know him first, as if Jesus alone was the point. Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And I've recently talked with a number of pastors and active church-going people who humbly admitted a bold and terrifying indictment. Here's, here's what they said. Can I... Can I tell you about Jesus, argue his deity, share him with others, but I just don't know if I really know him. Do you really know him? We are good at knowing all about Jesus. 
and going and doing His work. But to be His disciple, His follower, before we go and make disciples, that's the point. What if revival isn't just supposed to magically happen in our town? What if it really begins in you and me first? What if Jesus wants us before he wants our usability? Jesus wants us to be his representative, you and me in the world. So we need to start a revival in us first. Jesus, we need to know you and to experience you firsthand. Then our relationship will be used to represent you in this world. And that's loving our neighbors. The band is back up here. We're going to do one more song. And as the song is played, I invite you to maybe spend some time at our altar. Do you know your neighbors? Do you know the people that live next door? Have you talked to them? Do you know the person sitting next to you in church this morning? Let's be intentional about loving our neighbors so that Jesus might do a work not only in us but in them and in our neighborhood. I invite you to stand and worship and come as you feel the Spirit lead you to the altar so that he may place upon your heart a neighbor that you might pray with. Please, please join us in worship.